Welcome to the course on plasma physics and applications. Today we will discuss transporting tokamak plasmas going beyond the classical paradigm we have illustrated last time. We will uh, dwell on the limits of the classical model, highlighting the presence of the so-called neoclassical effects that are related to the orbits that are complex in a tokamak environment. We will also underline the fact that the uh, processes are not always diffusive, that provide transport. But then we will focus primarily on the so-called anomalous transport. This is the transport caused by presence of turbulence in the plasma. Turbulence is developed from the uh, waves and instability that are naturally occurring in fusion plasmas. We will highlight how to measure turbulence in plasmas, providing a couple of examples, and uh, the difficulties of modeling turbulence and its consequences in the plasma. We will then focus on the empirical approach to transport and how we can uh, make predictions based on the present experiments for the future devices. I would like to start by reminding ourselves what we concluded from our analysis of classical theory. We have uh, used the very simple model of random walk considering that the collisions between charged particles lead to uh, jumps in the orbit of the order of the Lambda radius of all the particles, of course, across the magnetic field, which uh, leads to a diffusion equation here for the density, which has uh, a main parameter, the perpendicular diffusion coefficient, which can therefore be uh, simply estimated on the basis of the square of the step of this diffusing process, which is the Larmor radius, divided by the collision time, or times, of course, the effective collision frequency for the exchange of, of momentum in this case. We can now see how this can be verified in the practical uh, situations in the experiment, in particular how the cross-field diffusion coefficient can determine Crucial, a crucial parameter for fusion, that is the confinement time. Let's take a very simple geometry, cylindrical plasma, cross-section of the cylinder has a radius A, the cylinder has a length L. So we can evaluate the confinement time for this uh, situation in the following way. So tau is my confinement time, is the ratio of the total number of particles in my plasma, which uh, will be containing the cylinder. So these are the plasma particles in the cylinder. There are n of them. So tau will be given by n divided by the loss rate, so the number of particles lost per unit time. The number of particles n that we have will be the density times the volume and the number of particles that are lost because of uh, transport will be the flux, say, going to the walls, times the surface of the uh, walls. So, so the volume is pi a square L, and the surface of this uh, cylinder around, neglecting the end surfaces, will be 2 pi a L. And of course I put gamma here with the absolute value um, not to be confused by the sign in fixed law. Now, I simplify here with different uh, terms. I end up with Na divided by 2 d perp times the gradient of uh, the uh, density in the radial direction. The radial direction is the direction from center to the edge of the cylinder. And I evaluate in a simple way this uh, gradient in terms of order magnitude as just the density divided by the uh, radius A. So that is Na divided by 2d perp n over A. Uh, interestingly, the density term goes away, a, um, ending up just with A squared divided by 2d perp. So this is one way to relate in a simple way the confinement time that one can measure experimentally to the value, at least in order or magnitude, of the diffusion coefficient in the perpendicular direction. A is the size of uh, the plasma. 
Let's take, for example, the case of the jet tokamak, which uh, we know quite well. If I apply this classical uh, theory that we have developed so far, the perpendicular diffusion coefficient for electrons, for example, is of the order, as we say, the rho Larmor squared times the collision frequency. I put the numbers, and that is about 5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters square per second. What about the experimental value, or the order of magnitude of the experimental value? A is of the order 1 meter. The experimental confinement time is of the order 1 second. So if I evaluate the perp from this uh, expression we have uh, seen together, that would be of the order of uh, A squared over tau. Here I don't even put the factor of 2 just to underline the fact in fact really evaluating orders of magnitude. And that gives me something like uh, 1 meter square per second. 1 meter square per second to compare with the classical prediction of 5 times 10 to the minus 5 meter square per second. So of course this is much, much larger than the classical theoretical prediction. This is quite a general observation that we have in many, many fusion devices, and in fact in many magnetically confined plasmas, even at lower uh, temperatures and lower densities. In general, the experimental diffusion coefficient is much larger than the classical value. Not only that, but also the scaling of the experimentally measured or estimated diffusion coefficient with parameters such as the magnetic field or even the temperature, etc., does not follow the classical prediction. So the first question is, why is the classical model so far off, both quantitatively to evaluate the uh, PERP in particular, and also in terms of the scaling of the PERP upon the plasma parameters? What have we done wrong? First uh, issue that comes to mind is that perhaps the step size, at least in the tokamak uh, uh, plasma, is uh, not quite the Larmor radius, so it would be more complicated than that because the orbits are more complicated than that. So let's look at that uh, effect, at that possible effect. As we have learned in previous lectures, in the tokamak, particles move along helical field lines. In addition to their gyro motion, they have a orbit that goes around the helical field lines. In fact, we have uh, constructed a tokamak machine, a tokamak concept, exactly to do that so that on average it drifts are compensated and particles can be confined. But as the particles go around this helical structure, they would go in, out, in, out, in, out. In general, the magnetic field is proportional to 1 over r, where r is the distance from the axis of the torus. So that means if particles go around in the way we have just seen in the picture, they will see a field that will be going up and down, up and down, up and down. Let's say this is uh, along the particle orbit. If a particle sees a field that goes up and down, up and down, so it means it experiences minima and maxima will be because it sort of moves along this direction back and forth, it may be trapped in the minima of B. It may be trapped by the mirror trapping effect that you have discussed in the first part of the course. Of course, not all particles are trapped. The trapping will depend on the pitch angle of their velocity and on the depth, if you like, of this uh, variation of the magnitude of B that they see along their orbit, which in itself depends on inverse aspect ratio, which is the minor radius A divided by the major radius of the torus. But some particles will be trapped in this effective mirror. And the particles that are trapped will follow a trajectory that is not really going all the way around, but they will be actually confined to some portions of the torus. And if we project that trajectory on the poloidal plane, I'm mean following one here, for example, or a second one here, that will look like a, a banana. So this is what we call these banana orbits. These banana orbits represent the orbits of the trapped particles. Trapped particles meaning particles that are actually trapped in the minima of the magnetic field as they see 
variation of the field along the orbits going in and out, in and out the torus. So why is this relevant to our discussion of transport? Because if particles move quickly around banana orbits and they collide, say I represent here another banana orbit like that, as a banana orbit sort of next to it in red, suppose a particle is moving along this blue orbit and collides with another particle at this point, A may jump to a different banana orbit and follow that again. So this jump is such that the displacement of the or of the particle on average will be not of the size of the Larmor radius anymore, but will be of the size of the width of the banana orbit, which we call delta V. So my step size in the collision process will be of the order of the banana orbit with delta B. And if I calculate that, that will be equal to the safety factor Q at the location of the orbit times the Larmor radius for the particle, in this case I have taken electrons, divided by the square root of the inverse aspect ratio, epsilon, again the ratio of the minor to major radius. So we, all, we know now the step size. What is the effective collision frequency? Well, it will be similar to the collision frequency for the exchange of momentum that we have seen before, for example, between electron and ions, but corrected by, again, a factor that is the inverse aspect ratio, A over R. Now, not all particles are trapped, so we need to account for that. So we say that the fraction of trapped particles is of the order of the square root of this uh, inverse aspect ratio, epsilon again. So the contribution from trapped particles will be what we call the neoclassical diffusion, corresponding to a neoclassical diffusion coefficient, perpendicular to B, will be equal to, or, or the order of, the fraction of trapped particles that are actually undergoing this process, times the step size squared, times the effective collision frequency for the process. Now I take the numbers um, for jet and noticing and of course I can um, in fact express the terms as we have developed them before in the way of q squared divided by epsilon to three halves times the classical diffusion coefficient. So I take the numbers for jet, let's uh, say q of order 3.5, epsilon is about 0.3. So the neoclassical term, which is the neoclassical diffusion coefficient, related to the fact that the orbits are not simple. Larmor orbits, but they are more complicated and they are on a ploidal plane in the form of bananas, is about 75 times the classical diffusion coefficient that we have seen before. Now this is, of course, an improvement in the sense that we are getting a little bit closer to the values that we observe experimentally, but remember that we were orders of magnitude off, and we are still much, much lower than the experimentally measured or estimated data. So even this correction, which is in fact necessary, leading to this neoclassical term, neoclassical diffusion coefficient and for neoclassical transport, does not account really for experimental values, and in fact does not even account for scalings in many cases. So we have to ask ourselves another question. Uh, we have uh, sort of corrected the step size with the proper orbits. We have uh, considered a rather uh, standard collision frequency, or even, even correcting that um, with the appropriate uh, term for this uh, neoclassical effect. But that's not sufficient. So we can, what else can we do? Perhaps we can even question the hypothesis of classical or even neoclassical diffusion. Are they really satisfied? This is a, a little diversion, but it's important, uh, at least conceptually. What we have assumed was that the classical diffusion was characterized by the Gaussian distribution of uh, step sizes. In fact, we have taken even uh, the same step size for all uh, particles of the same species. This may not always be the case. We can have a non-Gaussian distribution. For example, uh, probability distribution functions that have heavy tails, or in other words, they have a non-negligible probability of having very, very large steps. 
this is a typical situation of what's called the levy flight. Effects that are non-local between different parts of the plasma. Effects that are not really uh, described well by a single scale, so effects that are so-called scale-free. So that's for the step size. Um, this may not be distribution distributed according to Gaussian distributions, but also we may have situations that are non-Markovian. In other words, each step is not necessarily independent of the previous step. So there may be memory in the system. So there may be long-range correlation also in terms of time. So these are situations that are not described by the very simple um, classical model we have seen so far. These two movies illustrate the difference between two situations. On the left is a situation uh, we have seen so far, is the Brownian motion. So it's a particle undergoing uncorrelated steps of the same size, or a size distributed according to a very simple Gaussian distribution. On the right, we have a simulation of a so-called Levy flight. So it's a non-diffusive transport in which there's a finite probability for having very large uh, jumps as opposed to an exponentially small probability of having very large jumps, which would be the case of uh, uh, the classical Brownian motion, which will lead to diffusion. The consequence of this kind of uh, so non-classical behavior is that the diffusive uh, transport model does not work. So we have a, a situation which is non-diffusive, in which the mean square displacement is no longer necessarily proportional to the time simply, but is proportional to the time to an exponent gamma, which may be smaller than 1, and that's the case of subdiffusion, or larger than 1, and that's the case of uh, superdiffusion. I notice that non-diffusive transport, in fact, is very, very um, uh, common in physical systems. We have uh, examples uh, here, the dispersal of banknotes, for example, you uh, live in your village or in your town using uh, banknotes and the uh, transport of these banknotes may be described by a, a Gaussian distribution, a relatively a simple sort of classic and random walk. But suddenly you take the plane and you go to a different uh, country and a different uh, location and uh, you use banknotes there and so you have a sudden uh, big jump that's not accounted at all by a Gaussian distribution, therefore by a classical motion. Other examples in nature include, for example, the, uh, the motion of sharks that are looking for fish to, to eat, to, to feed on. Um, they uh, explore and, uh, and uti utilize a local uh, sort of reservoir of fish, and then suddenly there are no fish anymore for them to eat, and they have a very long uh, jump in their motion, which is a, a levy flight to go to a different location, uh, maybe thousands of kilometers away, and start feeding on new uh, uh, reservoirs of, of fish. So this uh, non-diffusive transport is uh, uh, pretty common in many physical systems. However, even considering that the process may be non-diffusive, um, we still need to understand what is the underlying reason for that, and also we need to understand why the predictions of diffusion coefficients and uh, the corresponding confinement time are so far off um, compared to the experiment. Orders of magnitude off. So Coulomb collisions do not necessarily explain what will be observed in the plasmas in terms of transport. And even sort of correcting or, or generalizing the classical approach may uh, not help at all in explaining what we measure in the experimental uh, situation. The answer to the question of what is the underlying mechanism that makes uh, diffusion and transport so much more effective than the Coulomb collisions would make is turbulence. The transport that results from turbulence is referred to as anomalous transport to indicate that it is not a collisional effect. It is in fact generated by the interaction of plasma particles with small scale collective instabilities, which is what turbulence is, and in fact is by far the dominant factor in the confinement of a plasma for magnetic infusion. Turbulence is generated by the instabilities that tap the free energy present in the plasma gradients. This free energy is the source for small-scale instabilities that combine non-linearly to give rise to turbulence.
this is a picture of a simulation showing, showing the um, structure that uh, forms in a fairly complex manner inside the tokamak in the turbulence that characterizes the tokamak. And in this uh, simpler sketch, we see that uh, particles and indeed even heat are kicked out by this turbulence from the confinement region to the uh, outside. In fact, turbulence in general is a fundamental science question that remains uh, at least partly open. Again, turbulence is a spontaneous way of releasing free energy associated with flows or gradients in the presence of non-linearities and of uh, dissipation. Turbulence just, just happen in plasmas, of course, is uh, present in many, many, many physical systems, and it acts over a large variety of uh, scales, both spatial and temporal. The pictures here illustrate such a variety. Here uh, we see a picture of the turbulence present in the global uh, atmosphere of our planet. Turbulence is present, for example, in the flow of the wind, in this case beyond, behind um, wind turbines. Turbulence is present in the mixing of fluids, like uh, water and glass. And turbulence is even present in uh, systems that are sort of man-made, like uh, the stock exchange. Let's focus on the origin of turbulence in tokamak plasmas and on its consequence on transport. Turbulence that's important for transport in plasmas originates from the nonlinear development of uh, electrostatic waves, typically. Electrostatic waves um, mean that in the wave itself, there is practically no perturbation to the magnetic field. So we can neglect the uh, magnetic part of the wave. There are several kinds of electrostatic waves of importance for turbulence. Um, typically, they are relatively low frequency compared to the gyro frequencies of both the electrons and the ions. Uh, these are waves that we refer to as drift waves or sound waves or interchange waves that are driven unstable by pressure gradients and what we call bad curvature, that is opposing magnetic curvature and pressure gradients. What are the consequences of the turbulence on transport and what is the cause of transport? Well, the uh, turbulence results in the fluctuation of uh, electric fields. Primarily, as we said, uh, mostly we deal with electrostatic uh, waves. And when we have a fluctuating electric field, we, ha we have a fluctuating flow that's associated with the E cross B related to that field. This flow can cause transport. So if we represent it flux here, gamma f, that is associated with the, uh, these uh, perturbations, this is the time average of the product of the perturbation in the density and the perturbation in the velocity. The perturbation in the velocity comes from the uh, E cross B term, in which B can be considered as the background magnetic field, because as we said, the wave is primarily electrostatic, while E, of course, is the uh, perturbed field associated with the wave and its nonlinear development. So at the end, we have uh, the uh, product between density and field, or in density and the potential, if you like. There has to be a uh, time average cross B0, where B0 is the ambient magnetic field divided by B0 uh, square. So, of course, term transport depends on the fluctuation amplitude that we have. But it also depends on the phase between the potential and the density fluctuation. And let's look at that in a, a slightly um, more in-depth way. To do that, we have a picture here that illustrates the case for a single mode in which we have uh, the potential fluctuations or the potential uh, oscillations, if you like, say is a function of uh, time going down. We assume there's a magnetic field V0 coming out from uh, the uh, board. And we see that the potential or the electric field 
course, will cause a perturbation in the velocity, which we call the flow velocity here, which will be going around in the eddies, if you like, um, which are associated with these potential uh, wave structures. And the point is that you also have density fluctuations, and these are represented by the black lines in this third column. But the key point is where are these density fluctuations uh, with uh, respect to the flow velocity fluctuations? And if they are perfectly aligned, so if they are in phase with each other, which is not the case of the picture, of course there would be no transport. Everything will oscillate up and down together, but there will be no net transport. When density and uh, potential are in phase, we um, call the situation uh, a adiabatic situation. So this is a typical condition we have uh, assumed in the first part of the course to make uh, simple estimates like uh, the evaluation of the uh, screening of the charges and the by length. Now when adiabaticity is present, no transport is induced by the fluctuations. But when it is not present, in other words, when the density and the flow velocity issued by the potential fluctuation are not in phase, then you can have transport. And the reason for that is that you can have, uh, of course, parts of the oscillation that lead to uh, a net flow in one direction, and parts of the, the oscillation that lead to a net flow in the opposite direction. But if the flow in the opposite direction is characterizing a large number of particles, then you have a bigger um, effect for the outflow than you have for the inflow, where you have a small number of particles. So in other words, when you have a, a flow that goes one direction and the other, but associated with a different number of particles, you can have a, a, a net overall transport of the plasma in one particular direction, in this case, uh, to the uh, right-hand side. So in this case, we would have a net flux to the outside, to the right-hand side of uh, uh, this uh, board. So once again, the transport that is caused by the fluctuations depends on their amplitude, which is uh, very intuitive, of course, but also on the phase between the potential and density fluctuations. Let's just comment on a few general features of turbulence in tokamax. Typically, we have scales that are very long, parallel to B. This is typically mostly in the toroidal direction of the tokamak, and scales that are small perpendicular to B. So the eddies that cause transport are therefore illustrated here in the cross section, and they uh, mix, if you like, the hot core with the cold edge, and that's exactly what we do not want if you want to confine the plasma to make it fuse in the core. How do we characterize turbulence experimentally? In general, when you have plasma waves, and you know, even if they develop nonlinearly into turbulence, you have several plasma parameters and electromagnetic fields that fluctuate together. For example, you have the density that fluctuates, the temperature that fluctuates, the magnetic field in case of electromagnetic perturbations. Um, this can be neglected if we have electrostatic perturbations, as we said and the electric field, and so on. So you have to measure, in principle, several parameters. You also have to measure over many spatial and temporal scales, because fluctuations uh, cover several scales. And depending on where you are in the plasma profile, you also have a relative fluctuation amplitude that are very uh, different. Typically, they are relatively small in the core, say less than 1% and relatively large towards the edge. And at the very edge, they can reach um, much more than 10%, typically. We do have a number of experimental techniques that are dedicated to measuring the different quantities and scales that characterize turbulence in fusion plasmas, particularly in tokamaks. For example, OECE, or that is electrocytron electro emission, reflectometry, interferometry, scattering of laser light, and so on. I'll just take one example to illustrate um, typical measurement of turbulence in a tokamak. This is uh, the measurement of the frequency spectrum 
and of the amplitude in terms of RMS amplitude as a function of uh, essentially the radial position in the plasma of what we call a geodesic acoustic mode and the fluctuations that are associated with it. We don't need to go into the details of the physics of this mode. And this is done on the TCV tokamak uh, plasma in Lausanne. Uh, this is just to illustrate that you have, uh, in this case, a mode that has a, a main frequency component going across the profile, but an amplitude that does vary across the profile. It also illustrates a particular technique. In, um, in this case, we use the so-called phase construct system, which is built to detect oscillations of the phase of a beam of light that is uh, injected through the plasma and is diffracted by the plasma density fluctuations. The fluctuations are transformed into phase fluctuations and then detected over a range of uh, frequencies that can go uh, as high as hundreds of kilohertz. Let's just go back to a few general considerations on the uh, effect of turbulence on transport, in particular via the development of macroscopic structures. What we can say uh, in simple terms is that the effective diffusion coefficient, in our case perpendicular to the magnetic field, can be uh, simply estimated by taking the size of the wave structure or the turbulence structure squared, of course, as this would be the typical step size, divided by the correlation time. Now, of course, uh, small radial wavelength mode would give small steps, that is, small transport. But turbulence can develop no linear macroscopic structures. And in fact, it does in many, many, many systems in which large-scale organized structures are present. The example here is that of a uh, hurricane in the southern uh, United States. So in plasmas, you can have radially elongated structures, and that would be bad. Let me just draw them, for example, here. It would be bad. This is the cross-section um, of our uh, tokamak, for example. It would be bad because the step size would be large, see so the order of the size of uh, the structure itself, and therefore the effective uh, diffusion would be fast. However, you could have flows that are also generated by the turbulence itself that could uh, be sheared, and that is non-uniform in the radial direction. For example, that could be larger on the outside than on the inside. And the result of these flows would be that the uh, structures would be uh, distorted or even broken. Let me just try to illustrate what would happen, say, in the presence of these flows. These structures will be uh, distorted or even broken apart. And this would actually be very good for a transport because the radial size of the step will be significantly shortened, both when they are distorted and, in fact, when they are completely broken apart. So turbulence could do both things, could do the uh, generation of uh, large-scale structures in the radial direction, that is bad, because it would facilitate transport radially. At the same time, it could also provide shear flows that would break or distort these structures and then restore something that would be uh, relatively beneficial, that is, a level of transport that could be relatively small because, again, the step sizes corresponding to the sizes of the structures associated with the waves and the turbulence would be small again. Let's just say a, a word about the uh, possibility of simulating turbulence and transport in the tokamak plasma, in particular, in this case, in, uh, in ether. As you will uh, uh, see uh, in the evolution of the movie that's being shown on the right, you see that the uh, instabilities are being generated by the gradients in the tokamak, but that also evolving not linearly into turbulence, and then evolving into structures that first seem to be elongated radially, and then seem to be, at least in some regions, sheared radially and sheared apart uh, by flows that are non-uniform in a radial direction. These are the famous uh, shear flows.
or zonal flows. This is a simulation of the ITER plasma on one of the highest performance computers used for fusion. It's 1.3 petaflop computer in this case uh, with a billion of particles and a billion of uh, points in the grid to simulate the ITER uh, core plasma. On the left you also see an image of the zonal flows of Jupiter uh, indicating that this question and this uh, development of turbulence into uh, regions of reduced transport because of uh, the presence of microscopic uh, self-organized structures is not unique to uh, tokamak plasmas. These uh, shear and zonal flows that we have seen in tokamak plasmas but also in other situations can in fact create local transport barriers, that is local regions where the transport is very, very, very small. And this is very beneficial for uh, fusion. This region can be at the edge or in the core, and they've been observed experimentally. So the profiles that result um, from the presence of this region, in fact, correspond to different operating conditions of uh, a tokamak plasma, typically, and uh, uh, what we refer to as plasma scenarios. So let me just illustrate them. Uh, this is the radial profile, say the radial uh, coordinate normalized to the minor radius of our uh, tokamak, say between 0 and 1. So this would be a region corresponding to the uh, section of our tokamak device. And you can have um, transport barriers at the edge, we said, or in a core. Or in some cases, you don't have them at all, of course. When you don't have them at all, we have a situation uh, referred to as the low confinement mode. We're not helped by, if you like, by the beneficial turbulent structures that set uh, these transport barriers. In this case, the low confinement mode, or L mode, has a profile that's uh, relatively uh, simple, but also relatively low, and profile here is represented in terms of the plasma pressure. And the low plasma pressure, of course, implies a relatively low uh, fusion performance. You can also have a situation in which you develop a transport barrier at the edge, so a very uh, steep gradient in a relatively narrow region, but even just in a relatively narrow region will uh, help a lot for the performance of the whole plasma, in particular of the plasma core, because it, it is as we have the pedestal on which the whole profile was uh, sitting. And so the rest of the profile will be uh, similar to what we have in L mode, but it would be sitting on a pedestal created by this transport barrier at the edge, and so it would be much higher in terms of pressure, and therefore much higher in terms of um, potential fusion performance. This is what we refer to as the high confinement or H mode. It's one of the modes we actually foresee for the uh, possible operation of a fusion reactor. You could also have a transport barrier more to the inside, what we call the internal transport barrier. This would be a, a shear flow generated transport barrier in some region um, not too close to the edge of the plasma. And this would also generate a boost in the pressure again, which will increase further the performance of the uh, core in terms of fusion. This is uh, what we refer to in trans internal transport barrier scenario or advanced modes of operation of tokamaks has been discovered uh, relatively recently. Now we have seen that uh, in the sketches of the profiles we can gain a lot even having a transport barrier only at the very edge of the plasma because the turbulence actually couples the edge and, and the core. So the profile of the core of the plasma is relatively um, says similar to the situation in which you don't have a transport barrier. And in fact, to uh, highlight this uh, coupling between the edge and the core performance, um, I illustrate here the findings of different uh, turbulent models uh, into which uh, we will not go. In terms of the fusion gain, versus the temperature of the pedestal, that is the region that's uh, um, made um, at higher 
pressure by the presence of the edge transfer barrier. And although the details of the different models are different, and even the uh, details of the uh, exact values are different, in all cases, we see that by increasing the pedestal temperature, diffusion gain, capital Q, which we can call diffusion performance, can uh, actually goes up in all cases. So it is very important to have a pedestal good performance in order to have a good fusion gain in the plasma core. Now we have, uh, uh, of course, uh, played experimentally with uh, several devices, particularly several tokamaks. We have a measured transport, we have measured uh, confinement time, and we have varied all the, po the possible parameters to explore the dependence of the confinement time upon these parameters. And in the absence of a complete ab initio theory, because of this complexity in the turbulence, what we can do is to plot the different uh, results from the different experiments worldwide in an empirical transport scaling kind of plot. In particular, this is something we can use to design future devices, and this is something that has been used to design the ITER machine that's being built at the moment. This is the plot that uh, summarizes um, these findings, representing the confinement time measured experimentally in seconds, as opposed to the uh, predicted confinement time predicted here on the basis of a scaling law, which includes the main parameters of the machine and of the plasma. Here I put the three main um, parameters that play a major role. That is the side of the plasma, the major radius, which appears as a power 1.97, say about 2. So of course we gain in the confinement as we increase the size. We gain also some if we increase the toroidal magnetic field. We don't gain much because the dependence is only to the power 0.15. And we gain by increasing the plasma current, which of course reduces the size of the orbits of the particles inside the tokamak. The different machines are, are represented by different colors here, and you can see that we cover quite a, a range as the uh, two uh, axes are uh, logarithmic. I highlight our own machine, the TCV tokamak here, but of course there are many, many machines, and in particular as we go towards uh, large confinement times, um, that means we also go in towards large and large machines. Uh, the jet device here is uh, uh, the one providing all of the uh, red points, uh, and therefore is the one that is the closest to the extrapolation we need to make for ITER, which needs a few seconds of confinement time. And therefore, based on the scaling, we can uh, devise is its size. So this is a sort of a wind tunnel approach that we use to dimension the future devices like ITER. But of course, we also like to uh, further our understanding of turbulence because that would uh, improve the reliability of the prediction and would also make uh, suggestions for the ways to uh, go uh, to uh, optimize the tokamak concept in general. So in summary, we have seen that uh, in fusion devices, transport is generated mostly uh, by turbulence. Simulations and indeed experiments indicate that shear flows that is, flows that are not uniform in the radial direction of a device can very significantly reduce transport. And the transport barriers that are associated with these shear flows, in fact, determine different plasma scenarios or different operating conditions for our future reactor. At the moment, we don't have a complete understanding of turbulence, and therefore we use empirical scalings to extrapolate confinement in future devices and to design the size, in particular, and the main parameters for uh, the future experiments.